I want to tell you about a terrible tragedy of justice that's going on, and I don't know how exactly it happened, but somehow our prisons are completely full of innocent people. In fact, we let all the guilty people go, but the innocent people are the only ones left in all of the prisons, whether it be a maximum security prison or just an overnight detention center. Somehow we've only locked up the wrong ones. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is ask them. See, I did a lot of prison ministry over the years, and while there are a small percentage of people who freely admitted they were guilty and that they were there for the right reasons, most had some story about why it really wasn't their fault. They would say things like, listen, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I still remember sitting with a, a group of uh, guys at a men's meeting that was inside a prison. And, and one of the guys said, yeah, I'm, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the guy next to him said, you mean still at the scene of the crime when the police got there? And uh, they all laughed at that because they were like, well, actually, yeah, come to think of it. I guess we were all at the wrong place at the wrong time, sometimes doing the wrong thing. And somewhere inside, they knew what everyone really knew, which is the vast majority were guilty as charged, and in some cases, not even charged at the full level of guilt. Now, you think about this, it's a tragedy maybe in our, in our prisons, but it can also be in other places. And if you can find someone who will say they are sorry for their crimes, for the things that they have done wrong, for the things that they have done to hurt people, more often than not, you will actually find someone who's mainly sorry that they got caught. Sorry that they had to suffer the consequences. And there's a, a current saying that people use. It's almost overused now. It's probably come and gone. But it's, it's a song that somebody's saying, but it's also just a slang that people use, which is sorry, not sorry. Uh, if you're around young people for any length of time, someone will say sorry, not sorry. And what they basically mean is, I am sorry that I'm not sorry. The only apology you'll get from me is that you're getting no apology from me. And basically what they're saying is, I really don't care if I hurt you or not. Please accept my apology for no apology. Sorry, not sorry. And see, the other terrible tragedy, again, where I served there in a junior high and high school, even elementary school, is one of my roles is discipline. And I think of that as probably the funniest irony that has ever been, that my office is now the place people go to get in trouble, when, when that was certainly a part of my upbringing. That, but I was on the other side of the desk, right? But my office is where offenders offer up excuses for various shenanigans, you know, and I have heard some very, very creative ones. And I'm like, well, that's some creative writing. That's amazing. Um, you know, that's, that's really great that you're using your imagination there. And I don't know how it keeps happening, but it does keep happening, which is we only catch the innocent ones. Again, if you don't believe me, just ask them. I'm, in, I'm, I'm innocent. I, I didn't do it. Do you know why you're here? That's one of my first questions. Do you know why you're here? I have absolutely no idea. Um, and, and, you know, they, they will then go on to deny that whatever happened that they weren't there for didn't happen, right? Yeah, well, it, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then you finally say, well, it, it, does this sound familiar? Did this happen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that, I, wasn't, I wasn't really involved. I was just kind of filming it, you know, or whatever. I was watching it or I was egging them on or whatever. But I didn't start it. I didn't start it. So-and-so started it, you know, and you get the whole circle of people and somehow... Nobody started, nobody was involved with it, and, you know, it, it didn't happen at all. But if it did, it wasn't them. And so there's lots of blame shift that goes on there. And, you know, it happens in everybody's life. I, it certainly, I could give some of my own excuses along the way, but one of my favorites was from Carissa. Um, just a little um, scenario when she was very young. She doesn't do these things anymore, but uh, that's why we kind of miss it. But when she was first learning to walk and talk, you know, she was doing a little of each. We actually went to a beach in Miami, and... Lynn was out there on the beach, you know, kind of laying on her towel and all the rest. And, and Carissa had a little sand shovel. And she was just saying, I sorry, mommy, I sorry. And she was just putting sand on Lynn. But all the while saying, I sorry, I sorry. But she kept doing it, you know, kept doing it. And again, though many people would be saying, I sorry, I sorry, I sorry, not sorry. Uh, I'm really still doing it, you know? And, and when you think of that, the graphic that I put up here, it was a game 
uh, that we used to play growing up. My grandmother, or I, my grandmother played it with me, and my mother played it. I think with our grandkids a lot and everything else, but we played it. And the game of sorry, if you remember uh, it in any way, it actually. Even its tagline is the game of sweet revenge because, you know, it says plan a family uh, game night and then, you know, tell each other, oops, sorry, you know, and knock each other off the board. So this is what you do when you're bored is board games. And this game here, sorry, sorry, not sorry about that bad joke, but um, you knock them back to the beginning. This is what you do. Oh, sorry, but you're really not sorry. It's actually the goal of the game when you think about it. And again, I went ahead and... and edited that because I think the theology of an apology is, is what I wrote down because an apology is more than a game, right? And, and it's something that actually probably a lot of families should sit down and sometimes say, hey, I'm sorry. I, but, but not sorry, I'm not sorry, but really I am sorry. And, and this is a skill that is someone doesn't have the art of an apology, the true art of it. I listen to it all the time, and I think that was not an apology. Somebody who go out and publicly apologize for something, and they have a press conference about how they're going to apologize for some horrible thing you did, and basically what they do is they apologize that everyone else hurt them. And you're like, how, how is that an apology? I don't really understand that. Or, I'm sorry that you misunderstood everything I ever said or did, but I'm really not sorry. And you think about that and you go, wait a minute, uh, what is the theology of an apology? What does a real apology look like? What does it mean to really say you're sorry and for people to be able to see that you're sorry? And I think 2 Corinthians 7 really deals with the difference between what might amount to a fake apology or at least an incomplete one and a real apology. What this chapter calls worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. It's between regret and real repentance. And again, when you think about this, we'll go over it more with some uh, specifics as we get into it, but worldly sorrow is self-directed. It's kind of like, well, I'm sorry I suffered if I did, and I'm, I'm sorry I got caught, and that sort of thing. People can have regrets. Lots of people have regrets. Um, but when you think about it, God, godly sorrow is God-directed first. I'm, I am sorry that I have offended and wronged God. But second of all, it's others-oriented too, that I genuinely regret not what happened to me, but maybe what happened to them as a result of what I've done. And so when you think about this, regret is from the world, and it drives people away from God. People actually have regrets where they're like so you know, set in their ways and so angry about the way everything has, has gone, they really are, are upset, but they almost feel that God owes them apologies, you know, for the way their life has gone and things like that. And then you see uh, the opposite of regret for me is the idea of a reset. That whenever I think of repentance, that word, it's not a common word, but reset button, the reset button, it, it's all over all of our electronics. Every once in a while, our you know, electronic device gets all hung up and it can't go any further and stuff. And, and they always tell you, hit the reset, right? Hit the reset button. And what do you know? It's back working again. And there's a lot of times I think relationships aren't working and they're in desperate need, not of ever regret, but of a reset. And when you think about it, a reset is something that draws you closer to God, actually, and draws you closer to people around you. And it's a type of sorrow that actually leads to joy soon enough, right? And so when you think about this, again, it's a change of mind, it's a spiritual U-turn, it's all kinds of things, but real repentance is rare because we become a society, I believe, that has plenty of reason to repent, but we just kind of play the game of sorry, not sorry. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry that I suffered. Uh, you don't, I'm sorry, but that's a good one. And, and I'm sorry, except it's really your fault um, or it's someone else's fault or, or whatever else, or I was there, but it wasn't me. I didn't start it and I didn't stop it, but here I am again. And so you think about this. This is what he says in verse one. There's an art here. There's a, there's a explanation of what it is to have a real apology, to have it 
lead to the reset that God wants it to. And so this is what he says, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now that verse just taken by itself, it's kind of a, it's a pretty severe verse in some ways. You're like perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That sounds like a, wow, that's pretty heavy. You might remember just last week we talked about yokes and what it is to have a yoke on your neck. You know, what it means to actually share a load and be lifted in that load with God. And that's what the lead in to this verse is all about. Because remember, when it says therefore, it's always pointing to what came before, right? So if somebody just looks at a verse in isolation, maybe it's not going to have the same understanding that it would if they uh, do what you're supposed to do, which is read it in context. So you see the therefore, and he says these promises. What are the promises? The promises are you are not alone. You're yoked together with God. You're walking through life with God. You have someone to lift the loads and the burdens. And when you fall down, guess what? God didn't, right? If you think about stumbling and being yoked to another oxen, right? One oxen falls, the other one might, might get dragged down that, by that. But guess what? If I'm yoked together with God, if I've fallen, he hasn't. He's still up, right? He's still okay. And so you think about this, the promises, I'll just give it to you as the uh, page before says, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, it says this, God has said, I'll dwell in them, walk among them, I'll be their God, they'll be my people, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, don't touch what is unclean, I'll receive you, I'll be a father to you, you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. So that's the promise that he's saying, therefore, because of that promise, that you won't be alone. When you do have something to be sorry for, well, guess what? God's presence is very present in that time too. See, he says, I'll receive you. You'll be my family. And you think about this. I don't know what kind of family you came from, but almost everyone I know came from a dysfunctional family because they came from a family, right? But this is a functional family. If ever there was one, it's God the Father here saying, I will receive you. Maybe, maybe someone's physical parents didn't always do what God promises to do here. But this isn't a, a dysfunctional family. It's a place of grace. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of rightness. Things are right when you're with God. And so he's a great father to have whatever other kind of father you may or may not have, or mother or brother or any of the rest of these things. And so he's saying here, I want to fit into this family. How do I do it? Well, he says holiness. See, and I don't know about you, but to me, that word always sounded like a drag. It was kind of like, oh, holiness. You know, I guess I have to, first of all, I have to sit in my hands, right? As a kid, I figured holiness probably includes not moving, right? You should never move. And you certainly shouldn't say anything. Um, and you should have a halo over your head. And there, um, you're holy. Uh, whatever that means, you know. And if, if there was anything, um, seriously, I can remember these types of things. And even to this day, if your genes are holy and you have holes in your genes, you are not holy. Um, right? If you're, if you're in any way not meeting somebody's outward standard, well, you're probably very unholy because of the holes in your knees of your jeans or whatever else. And I think about that and I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not the picture the Bible paints. I like the word wholeness um, when you think of holiness. It's such a similar word, but wholeness is completeness. That's the actual underlying word behind it, to be whole. You know, when you think of whole foods, what is it saying? It's saying something that's healthy. It's something that's complete. It's something that hasn't had all the nutrients you know, pulled out of it. And so when I think of holiness, it's biblically something that has the things that ruin and wreck your life pulled out of it. And the things that enrich and are useful, those things are left in your life. The things that hurt and destroy and kill, those are taken out. And when I think about the, the great motivation for holiness, for wholeness, if you will, is what God has done for us. The Bible says it's not us trying to do something for God. It's us accepting what God has done for us. And one of the things he does is repentance, the reset button. Oh man, I blew it. Oh, I blew it. Reset. You know, there's nothing like playing a game where you're like, 
going to lose tremendously and just going boop, um, zero, back to zero. You know, probably in a video game, you're not like down 400 to, to seven in a football game simulation or something. You're like, hmm, 400 to seven. It's the first quarter. Um, I'm probably not going to win. Reset. And this is what God is saying, that repentance is a chance to hit the reset button. I think about this, if, if our kids are, are, you know, unwhole, <laughs> unholy, you know, disobedient, rebellious, all those things, um, it doesn't mean that they're not my kids anymore. There are times where I've joked with them that I did keep the receipt when they were born, because I did. I kept the medical receipt, so I could say, I, could, I used to say, I could take you back, but I think the warranties run out. Um, I think it was only good parts and labor for uh, two years or something like that, and, you know, labor. Yeah, sorry, not sorry, but that's the joke. Okay, so, um, but but with kids, you know, you can't really take them back. And so the truth is, I'm going to love them whether I like them or not, right? And they're going to love me, I hope, whether they like me or not. There's going to be times where I have wronged them. See, a lot of times parents always talk about all the things kids do wrong. I have had to apologize to my kids. I have had to say, I am sorry, dad was wrong. Those are very difficult times. But you know what? I, I think they're important times. And I can't do this, you know, as a, as a dad and just kind of say, well, I'm sorry, but you pushed my buttons or I'm sorry, but if you weren't such a rotten kid, any, any apology that turns into an accusation is not an apology. Just cut it before the butt. I'll just put it that way. Cut it before the butt. I was wrong. Let's just put a end on that sentence right there. And if they need to apologize, they will. And if they don't, here's one of the things, I'll, I'll say it again, but might as well say it more than once. There's no more powerful thing in life than to accept the apology that never came. See, a lot of people are waiting for an apology from somebody, and maybe it's never going to come. Accept it anyway. I accept that apology. On behalf of God, I will accept the apology that somebody never gave. Because the apology isn't freeing them, it's freeing me. So you know what? I accept. Well, I didn't give it. That's okay. I accept it anyway. Um, and so when you think about this, this is what God is looking for in our life. I, I really can't enjoy a relationship in its fullness with a kid, whether they're a student or my own kid or even a friend and all the rest of it. If they're just in their full bratty, self-absorbed criminal in training mode, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that they're, they're still a student, but man, they're still a kid. They're still my daughter. They're still my son, but wow. And so the, the first thing that I thought through as the scripture talks about it is this little thought, which is the best time to be sorry is before the sorrow really starts, okay? Before the sorrow really starts. What do I mean by that? Well, sorrow tends to lag just a little. There's things that we do and we do it wrong and we get away with it. You know, maybe the bitterness hasn't grown in a person who's, yeah, they overlook the offense and then you offend them and they overlook the offense and you're like, you know what? I'm kind of adding these up. This is kind of accumulating and there's, there's starting to be a brittleness and a bitterness to something and you're like, you know what? Um, a great time to tell someone you're sorry is before the sorrow really starts, before it really festers, before it gets to that point. And a lot of times, people will apologize when someone blows up. Have you noticed that? Someone blows up in their face and, hey, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't know. But what if they apologized before the blow up? See, I think about it with driving. Um, one of the things driving is, for those of you who do it, um, is it's a lot of little corrections to avoid big corrections. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, if imagine a person who only made huge corrections when they're driving. It's like, mm, they're off into the ditch, and then they're back on the road. And then they just kind of like drifting this way, and then the other time, and you say, wow, would you want to drive with that person? Would you want to drive around that person? Would you want to be around that person? But what driving really is, is all these little bitty, little bitty corrections that prevent huge corrections. And I think about that in relationships too. It's a learned skill sometimes, but I, I often think, man, 
You don't have to go around saying, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 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 I'm sorry. But it's just a realization that, whoa, I think, I think I'm starting to swerve in this situation. Let me correct it before it even gets to be a big deal. And this is part of what Paul was talking about in here because he says, let us cleanse ourselves. Let's, let's preemptively do this. Let's, let's take care of it before it becomes a terrible thing. You know, if I, if I only brush my teeth once a year before I go to the dentist, you're like, he'll be saying, sorry, sorry, we're going to have to take them all out. And you're like, what? How did this happen? Well, it happened by not cleansing yourself on a more regular basis. And so when I think about this, kids can be careless, you know, and accidentally mess things up, but they can be very deliberate. I can remember one of the things that happened to me is you could guarantee I would play flag football with my friends if I was wearing my dress pants, right? Dress pants equals flag football. Um, I don't know why it was, but the game would always break out when, hey, look, we got our church clothes on. Let's let's play tackle. Um, and, and my mom was like, no, 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 no. You know, it's like, there's, there's things that you can actually do directionally. And, and when I think about this, this is another thought. I'm throwing out several different things I've learned along the way with lots of different environments. Some of my own, I learned them the hard way. Other times, I learned them the easy way, which is I watched someone else make a mistake and I said, well, I won't do that. But this is one of the thoughts that I think people forget sometimes, which is that even forgiven sin hurts, right? God will forgive me with, for something, but guess what? God's God's got this capacity that people don't, right? People do not have the capacity to forgive and forget on the level that God does. God says, I throw your sin as far as the east is from the west. And most people say, I kicked it about 100 yards down the, down the road. <laughs> it's about the best I could do, right? I mean, God can, can say, I don't even know what we're talking about. People can't. And so one of the things I think about in my own life is it's easier to not make a mess than clean up a mess, right? It's easier to not break a window than clean up a broken window. And when you think about that, it's one of the things I do try to do as best I can in my life, which is the best time to be sorry is before the sorrow, right? I, I'm sorry I'm throwing this baseball at that window it hasn't broken in the four times I've hit it. Maybe I should move, right? Maybe I should stop doing, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I keep hitting that window. Psh, oh man, I am so sorry I broke that window. When would have been the better time to be sorry? See, this is what he talks about, the sins of the flesh and the spirit. And I think it's interesting because flesh sins are kind of easy for us to remember, right? These are the things you can go to prison for, right? stealing things and maybe big lies or murder and stuff like that. I mean, all the things that, you know, we would easily say, well, that's, that's wrong, that's bad. But notice that he says in that first part, sins of the spirit. And these are the things that put people into emotional prisons, right? You may not go to jail for this one. Bitterness, gossip, what are you in for? Well, I had a critical spirit. You know, I, I got 10 years for having a the covetous heart. What? I mean, these things, people don't go to jail for it, right? But Jesus even backed it up one and said, that's it is why people end up in jail, because they didn't stop before the sorrow started, and they got away with a little bit of anger, and they got a little more anger to go with it. And before you know it, if you don't learn to hit the reset button, you're going to be in the regret spot. And so you think about this, there's sometimes that little voice that says, this is a great time to be sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a better time to be sorry, to repent now. And I think about this, you know, my, my sister has helped me with untold number of things in my life. But one of the things I remember her telling to me at one stage in my life, I was trying to eat healthier. And she told me this, she said, you know what I found? It's easier to exercise self-control at the store than it is at the fridge at home. And I'm like, Sounds right. I mean, I'm like that. Wow. She said that, you know, once that quadruple stuff Oreo is at my house, I'm going to eat it. 
right? But at the at the store, I might be able to see the aisle that says Oreos and more and, and go, up, ah, run, you know, go away. But why? Because there's something about the ability to make a decision when you're not in the heat of the moment and you go, this is such an important part of life. This is why I say the theology of an apology. We'd have to say sorry less at the end if we would say sorry more at the start. Sometimes you don't even have to vocalize it. You just have to realize it. And then verse 2, you see this. He says, open your hearts to us. We didn't wrong anyone. We corrupted no one. We've cheated no one. I don't say this to condemn. I've said it before that you're in our hearts to die, die together and to live together. Now, I don't know if you notice it, but right here in verse 2, Paul's basically saying, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't do anything. Now, I started that way saying people, innocent people are everywhere. But one of the things that's interesting is I believe Paul on this one. They didn't wrong and I don't know about you, but one of the hardest things in life is to be misunderstood. Have you ever done something right and someone thought you did something wrong? Oh, man, does it hurt. Yet, I, there's times where I'm like, listen, I was wrong two weeks ago, but I'm not wrong now. This is, you know, why didn't you get mad at me two weeks ago? This, I was in the wrong there, but I didn't do anything here. And this is Paul kind of saying, you know what? I, for him to say this, if it, if it wasn't true, they could have backed up on it pretty fast. But part of what he was saying is, Remember, guys, I wrote some difficult things to you. I was there among you. And you, you have to have some degree of moral authority to be in these states. You know, you're seeing it in the news right now. But I was telling Lynn um, just the other day, if someone's famous and they've messed up, they should keep their mouth shut right about now. Why? Because here's what people do. They interview famous people about what they think about what just happened to some famous person. They go, blah, 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 moralize, moralize. Well, I would never. And then the news comes out on them and you're like, oops, <laughs> should have kept, I mean, keep my head down. There's, there's a thing that if you have an authority if you have a desire to in, to help somebody work through repentance you ought to do it first um you ought, to, you ought to be very clear on this does it mean you're perfect paul wasn't perfect he he many times owned up to things that he said hey this i would do this differently but in this chapter he's saying listen I, listen guys if you're mad you need to get mad at yourselves, not at me. I didn't do anything in this case, except point out your need for repentance. See, in real repentance, it's the road to reconciliation. And one of the things that I have found in my life is it's wreckage is easy. It's really easy to wreck things. Have you noticed how they destroy these stadiums right now, these big arenas and stuff? They're like, it took, I think, one of them eight seconds to fall. Um, they put charges all around it and like, wreckage, 12 seconds, you know, okay. why? Because we built a new billion dollar one next door to it, you know, and how long did that take? It takes forever to build something up. It takes nothing to tear something down. And so I think of the art of the apology. Again, there's so many people who have lots of practice doing it wrong. You ever seen this one happen? You know, two kids fighting, two brothers fighting, and they, one of them says, you're stupid to the other one. The mom says, hey, say you're sorry. Well, I'm sorry you're stupid, you know. I, I've, I've heard that one lived out in real life, you know. I, I Shake hands and, and, and make up, you know, and they're like, you know, they don't even want to do it. Are the, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're so stupid, you know, and they'll do that. They think we don't get it. They think we're that dumb as an adult that we don't see what's going on in that, right? But mainly, again, it's that sorry I got caught. And so, unfortunately, there are so many shattered relationships today, you know, all over the place that can be repaired with one thing that I know, which is I was wrong. I was wrong. When people love to fight for their rights, I think people should fight for their wrongs. I was wrong. Uh, I'm going to fight through that and say this. I made some mistakes. I did some things wrong. It's amazing how many people with a genuine repentance will allow somebody who has made horrible, horrible mistakes to get a second chance. We're, we're actually pretty ingrained in that. But one thing people can't stand is a false apology or one that turns back into an attack. 
Well, I know that I, I, I hit you the other day, but I'm, I, you pushed me. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry you got hurt, but, but it, you know, oof. You go, man, the other day I had someone ask, do you think I should go apologize? I said, not unless you've learned a lot in the last week, because uh, frankly, in your apology, you're going to go stomp on their toes some more. I said, do you mind if, if we try to do it on your behalf? Um, and, and that's what I told the person. I said, it, we'll keep working on this, but please don't go to try to fix it and break it worse. Um, you know, you, you, you gave a public apology. Don't go back to each individual and try and make it right. Because even now you keep telling us, well, yeah, but, and I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's going to make a bigger mess. So I think about this, verse 4, he said, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. When I think about this, part of being an adult is learning bold speech. Not, you know, angry speech or whatever else, or not just being mean. I mean, if you enjoy, you know, making people apologize or getting in, in people's face over stuff, then they, you probably need to be sorry for that. But, you know, it's hard to be a leader and be completely mild-mannered and never do anything that ever upsets anyone. Jesus was a very bold person. And so when I think about it, whether you're a friend or you're a parent or you're a child or you're, you know, a leader in some way, an employer or whatever, you're going to have to tell the truth sometimes. And in the process of that, you'll need tact, certainly, but you're also going to need boldness. Because if you're too tactful, people walk away thinking, I didn't do anything wrong. I guess they're here to give me a raise. And you're like, no, I'm not here to give you a raise. I'm here to raise some issues, right? I mean, we need to get very, very clear on this. I've seen people have this amazing Teflon um, that is just like, things just slide off them. A lot of times they get mad at other than every offense toward them sticks to them. But you try to address an area of their life that needs to change and it's like, shoo, you know, they got this superhero ability to not have any accusation stick. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't me. You don't understand. There's another part of this and all that. And you're like, we've talked about all that. See, this week, I, I probably had some of the most bold conversations I have ever had in my life. Uh, three different situations. And I won't go into the details of them because it doesn't matter. But we had to keep going back toward the issue. Well, that, that's very interesting, but that's not why we're here. This is why we're here. This is these four things have to change. They can never happen again. Do you understand that? Right. Well, there's this. OK, I've already talked with that person. This can't continue. Do you understand that? Right. And and some people would think that was an unloving thing to do. How, how can you talk to me like this as a as a pastor? I thought you're a pastor. I thought you're a Christian or whatever. And I'm, that's exactly why I'm doing this. To look someone right in the face, right in the eye, and say, this is going to be hard for you to hear. It's awkward for me to say, but it has to be addressed. Woo. You know, when you think about those things, you better pray up on those things because they are difficult. But when people start blame shifting, again, you have to say, well, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, and but here's the issue. And when I think about that verse 5, this is what Paul was saying. Indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside there were conflicts. Inside there were fears. I, did I remind you guys that 2 Corinthians is about the most honest book you're ever going to find of an autobiography of an amazing godly person who says, man, I was like, couldn't sleep. I was so tense over this the same guy who says be anxious for nothing in philippians says i was anxious about everything i love that about him because he knows that there's a gap between who he is and who we all want to be do you really want him just telling you lowest common denominator Here, let me spew all the stuff that was on my worst day no he he holds the standard and he says i hold and i'm chasing that standard but let me tell you <laughs> i'm glad i'm yoked together with jesus because there were times he said, God comforts the downcast. See it in verse 6? He comforted us. How? By the coming of Titus. Not only by his coming, but also the consolation which, with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, 
so I rejoiced even more. Paul's writings are complex, right? And, and it, something happens to us when we come here once a week. I actually try to go as fast as I can through chapters so that they connect and not do one of these, you know, three-year studies of a two-chapter book, which do happen. And there, there's even merit to that. But sometimes you forget where we started by the time you even get halfway through. But even in this one, there's like a five-chapter detour because this is a continuation of a thought from all the way back in chapter two. This is chapter two and chapter seven connected. And Paul was troubled. Why? Because he had confronted the Corinthians in an intervention. He had told them, hey, this can't continue. First Corinthians is all corrective. It's very corrective. It's can't, can't, sorry, you can't do this. Sorry, not sorry, but I need to tell you this. You know, and, and it was all these things that they weren't sorry about. They weren't repenting. They weren't doing anything. They barely had regret. In fact, they were rejoicing over a bunch of things they should have been sorrowful for. We're so tolerant, we put up with anything. You know, and he says, that won't work. You should be sorry. Those people should repent. That's the connection of the thought. So here, imagine yourself writing a letter. I don't know if you've ever done a difficult conversation with somebody. I, I try to use different thoughts, one of which, again, these are practical tips sometimes, but Emails. You know, we do electronic stuff a lot of times today. I always tell people email is for information, not confrontation. Don't ever send somebody a blast email. You don't know when they're getting it. They can't see your face. Don't be a coward. This is what I hate about our modern society. People sit behind their computer and say things they don't have the bravery to say in person. They would never dream of saying that, but they'll send a, set up a fake account, send an anonymous boom and go, there, I gave them what they, wow, you chicken, you know? <laughs> yeah, but when I think about this information, I just, if I need to confront somebody, I go, well, I'm not gonna email them, I'm not gonna text them. I'm going to go talk to them, I will face them, you know? It's, it's an important thought. Now imagine yourself writing a letter. Paul didn't have that luxury because he was in a different place, but he'd been there among them. They knew who he was. He wasn't some anonymous speaker out there. And imagine yourself writing a letter or a text or an email addressing difficult issues. And you're like, did they write me back? Nope. Did they write me back? Nope. Did they text back? No. How long has it been? Over a year. Several years, I haven't heard. this was Paul. Paul had sent 1 Corinthians out and he didn't hear back. And there's a gap of time, a long gap of time where he's like, man, I wonder what happened. I wonder if I'm welcome in Corinth. I wonder if I'm in trouble in Corinth. I wonder if these people who I'd poured my life into and the only reason I wrote that letter was because it was a love letter, truly, you know, and in it, 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter of all love chapters. But here's Paul writing a love letter, but it was a tough love letter, right? And he hears nothing back. Cricket. And then Titus shows up. And Ty, oh, Titus, where you been? Corinth, man. Let me tell you, your letter changed everything for the better. They love you there. They can't wait for you to come back. Life changed from your difficult letter. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for what you did. It changed everything. How would you feel? I mean, again, have you ever worried or wondered whether you did the right thing when you did something difficult? I certainly have. I have had sleepless nights just like you talked about there. Should I have said it? Should I have said it that way? Should I have said it that difficult? Should I have said it that direct? Should I have sent it? Should I have revised it? Should I have softened it? Should I, what? Oh man, I, are they mad? Uh, was it worth it? Was I wrong? Did I get the wrong perspective? I second guess myself, you have no idea. I second guess my second guesses of my second guesses, right? They're so nested deeply that I'm guessing about things that I haven't even remembered why I said it. But that's just part of, how I am. Titus came from Corinth and told Paul they repented. They were sorry. They weren't sorry they got caught. They weren't sorry that they personally suffered. They were sorry that they caused others to suffer. And they they're sorry that they caused the cause of the gospel 
to suffer. They are not offended that you stepped on their toes. They're thankful that you cared enough to do it. And you think about this, you, they didn't shift the blame. They didn't say, well, Paul, who does who he think he was? A small number of people did, but the people involved, the people directly involved said, thank you for loving us enough to not let us keep going down that road. How did Titus recognize the real deal? How did he know that they did? Look at verse 7. It says, earnest desire, mourning, zeal for the person. What is that? Well, again, if you're mad at somebody who has brought repentance to you, you need to repent of that, right? Well, I'm so mad that they, they, they made me feel bad. Man, if they made you deal good, <laughs> it's okay to feel bad if you're doing something that you should feel bad about. Verse 8, even if I made you sorry with my letter, look at this, I don't regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Do you see what he's saying here? There's like a tension. I love it because he says, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry, but I was sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I, I didn't regret it, but I did briefly regret it. Um, but now that I see the result, I don't regret it. I'm glad. Now, I'd, I'm not glad that you were pained by it, but I'm glad that you came to repentance through it. You see that conflict? I don't regret it, but I did regret it. Um, and when you think about that, there have been things that I have regretted till I saw the result. And there are things I haven't regretted until I saw the result. You see what I'm saying with both of those? There's like times where you go, yikes, I think I lost a friendship there. Actually, uh, there was a very severe situation in my life where I went two years without talking to somebody who was one of my dearest friends because of an, an intervention I had to do in their life where I had to go directly to them for something that they were in the wrong, undeniably in the wrong. And I didn't want to be the person. People elected me the person. I'm like, why do I have to go? I don't want to go. And I went. And that person counted me their enemy for two years. And we're friends today. And I think, man, I regretted it. You have no idea how I regretted it till I didn't regret it. Because it reset the situation. So again, I think about that. Did they harden their hearts? Did they rip up the letter? Maybe they initially did. I bet if you find a manuscript, original manuscript of First Corinthians, it's got some... Who, who, do they, who does he think he is telling us what we need to hear? And see, I love this because if you've ever done something that you had to do that you didn't want to do, you're going to regret it in the short term, but you'll never regret it in the long term. Because you think about this, if you have to counsel a coworker, if you have to talk to a friend on the phone about some sensitive subject, if you have to get real with a family member or you know one of your besties, address some issue, you're going to, if you're a sensitive person, and I hope you are, you're going to ask, was I too insensitive? <laughs> was I too tough? See, tough people don't ask that. Tactful people uh, wonder if they were tactful enough. Um, people with no tact don't ask that question. You're going to wonder in the short term. And probably if you wonder in the short term, you're going to find that you won't wonder in the long term. You're going to see, not always, but often. With perspective, you'll be sorry if you trade today's comfort for tomorrow's change. You say, man, I, I would rather, if someone's messing up their life and they're messing up the lives around them, if I care about them, I'll bring the message. I don't want to. I don't relish it, but I'll do it. See, the... Corinthians were upset, I'm sure, at first when they read the letter. That's easy to understand. But they rejoice now, and they rejoice with Paul. And Paul says, now I rejoice. Verse 9, not that you were made sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. That verse right there, verse 10 is to me in one verse the theology of an apology if you want to understand it there it is two types of sorry there are two types of sorry one is completely worse than worthless in my opinion and the other one is priceless so one type of sorry is sorry sorry period and then there's i'm sorry i'm not sorry sorry not sorry uh wishy-washy sorry godly sorrow 
it says godly sorrow, man, it leads to joy. Godly sorrow is when you're like, oh, I have wronged God and I have wronged others and I am wrong and I need to get it right and God's going to help me. And if you can forgive me, that would be great. That's a reset. Worldly sorrow? Well, I'm sorry this is so tense because I don't like tension and I just, uh, you know, it's all that. It's sorry of the circumstances, but it's not sorry that leads to life. See, worldly sorrow leads to regret. So again, I put godly sorrow, reset. <laughs> godly sorrow, life. Godly sorrow, reset. Worldly sorrow, regret. Godly sorrow leads to life. Worldly sorrow leads to death. The most classic example I can think of in the Bible of the difference between these two sorrows is Matthew 26. I'll read it for you. It's toward the end of that chapter and it's people you're familiar with. These personnel are very familiar to you. So here's a little personnel issue. Jesus had two followers, right? At least he had more than that. But two of them are mentioned here in Matthew 26. Peter was one of the leaders of the apostles, right? He was supposed to be the, one of the good guys. Then you got Judas. And we know Judas now as the betrayer, but they didn't know him that way then. He was always on the trips with them. He was treated equally with the disciples and did all kinds of wonderful things, preached messages that people responded to. So you didn't immediately know that Peter and Judas were two different people. Again, the bad music didn't play every time Judas walked in the room like it's in the movies. But Peter remembers right? It says here, the words of Jesus who had said to him, you'll let me down. You will let me down. You'll deny me three times. And this was Peter's reaction. It says he went out and wept bitterly. I mean, this is a guy, sorry. He is sorry. He is in one sorry sight at this point. I mean, a fisherman, a big, confident leader, apostle, just crying in a corner. <laughs> sorry he wept bitterly and it says the morning came and the people plotted against Jesus you know this story and it says Judas his betrayer seeing that Jesus had been condemned was this is the word it says remorseful sorry he was sorry and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver I don't even want the stupid money he's sorry man you would think this guy's so repentant I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? We don't care. <laughs> We're not sorry. We're not sorry you ruined your life. They didn't care anything about him. And it says he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. He departed and he went and hanged himself. You think about that and you go, wow, these two guys were pretty sorry that day. One was sorry unto life and one was sorry unto death. I think about those situations, and again, sorrow can lead people to do all types of things, but one of the things sorrow should lead someone to do if they're sorry is say, God, I'm sorry. And God says, I forgive you. See, the whole amazing thing about Peter's life is Peter went on to be better after this day, tremendously better after this day way more accommodating and understanding of people who failed than he was before this. This was an important step in Peter's life, but this was the stop in Judas's life. And I think to myself, how sad? How sad is that? The sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the Lord produces life. So you think about this, return to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, and we'll think on this. He says, observe this very thing, Paul does. You sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What does that mean? Man, I, I, I got to do better. Um, what clearing of yourself? They said, it, it, I, it, listen, if I've wronged people, I need to go make it right if I can. What indignation where they're like, I, I just, I'm disappointed in myself. I, I, there's, I, I can do things differently. What fear? Like, is, is there... These can actually be positive things where you go, there's no, uh, can God still use me? And I think it's an important thing for somebody to have the humility that gets a little bit afraid that maybe they missed out on something. The vehement desire, the zeal, the vindication. <laughs> I love it. And he says, in all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. This wasn't a small thing for them. They had committed a, a, a horrific 
damaging relational sin that he is addressing here. I mean, it was nasty. It was terrible. Even the heathens went, ugh. And, and, and he says, man, you guys, you made it right. You made it right. And how amazing is that when you think about it? Because I wrote this down. Sorry means sorry enough to stop. You can know you're sorry when you're sorry enough to stop. See, they stopped, right? They didn't say, oh, I'm, I sorry, and keep shoveling. <laughs> they say, I sorry, I sorry, but I sorry, I keep doing it. Again, very cute in Carissa's case, not cute in real sin case, right? And the next part is sorry enough to stop, but sorry enough to start. Sorry enough to start what? Doing something different. See, it's not just returning it to neutral. Well, um, sorry I broke the, the window. I kind of cleaned up most of the glass. You know, like, but I still don't have a window there, <laughs> right? I mean, making something better. Not just saying, well, I, I, I left, I stopped doing it. I'm not going to hurt you anymore. And you go, well, okay. There's still things that could be done there. Could you start being thankful to someone that you've actually been ungrateful toward? I mean, not just neutral toward them, but actually go back in the other direction. This is what he says. Therefore, I wrote to you, I don't do it for the sake of him who'd done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered the wrong but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. What is he saying? There's a bigger lesson to learn here than the few people who were directly involved. I didn't just do this for the benefit of, you know, you four people or these two families or anything. He says, I did this for the sake of all families. I did this for the sake of everyone in Corinth, whether they're in the Corinthian church or not, to look on and say, this is what a functional family does. This is what a healthy relationship looks like. Not that there's, you know, like that silly old thought from, I think it was a 70s song, which is love means never having to say you're sorry. I'm like, sorry? That's a sorry song. That's a sorry thought. That doesn't even come close to being the reality. Love means quickly saying I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry before the sorrow starts, so sometimes I don't have to walk around my house saying, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I just, in my mind, I go, whoa, that was sorry. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better. Next thing out of my mouth won't be that, right? You think about this, I just didn't do this, Paul says, for you. I did it for everyone, that, that it can transform a place, a reset button. I, I showed, if, if God can reset that mess, well, then there's other people who, they had never said sorry publicly because maybe people didn't even know all the stuff that had gone on. But they realized, well, if they, God can reset that, maybe my regret should turn into a reset. That would be really smart. That would be really good. See, people see so few examples of real change that there is nothing like the theology of an apology to see somebody humble themselves, God exalt that person, and repair that mess. You go, wow, that's, that's pretty important. See, the easiest thing to do in my life and in yours is to overlook and ignore problems. I, I love overlooking problems. Um, you know, oh, are you an overseer? Yep, I see right over all the problems. I don't even want to look at that. But you know what part of an overseer is? Is they're supposed to see things and deal with them, do things about them. And if you find someone who loves you enough, enough, not to constantly be telling, you need to apologize, you need to apologize, you need to apologize. But if you know someone who loves you enough to risk short-term discomfort for long-term benefit, you have found a real friend. See, I think of an Old Testament story. It's a great one. Um, There's one of the kings of Israel getting ready to make a really bad move. He had a history of making terrible moves. He's just one of the bad kings, right? And the king court tells him, uh, before you make this decision, you know, we got this godly prophet who's always here. He's like right downstairs. He's part of your, you know, cabinet of people. You should go talk to him. He goes, I don't want to talk to that guy. I hate that guy. He always prophesies harm. He's always giving me bad news. He's always telling me, well, I don't know, King, that doesn't sound like the best route. Maybe you could think about this. He said, I don't like that guy. Get rid of, fire that guy. In fact, I want to hire a guy who tells me I'm a great king. And you look at that situation, you go, that probably the only friend that person really had to say, King, 
Come on, think it through. See, you can run from the truth. I can. The consequences will always find you. This is one of the things I say to my high school students is I'm like, if you get out of high school and you don't learn anything from me, you're going to learn it. Because remember, <laughs> your choices have consequences. And sometimes, unfortunately, innocent people pay for your consequences. But more often than not, you'll be the direct person paying for them in broken relationships and broken everything else. And you go, I can give you good advice, but you know what? I don't have to live your life. I have to live my life. I go home to, in many cases, not every case, harmony. Why? Because I got... Uh, Sometimes I've had to say over and over and over again, I am wrong. Not, not figuring out, well, what are my kids doing wrong? I have to say, what am I doing wrong? I, I have some things I got to address. Now, again, everybody's got things they got to address. But you can run from that truth. And I tell the kids, you, will, you can't run from your consequences. <laughs> can't run from them. You can push them forward, but you, they'll catch you. And Paul's saying, I want the best for you. I'm willing to risk the relationship to tell you that. And verse 13, he says, Therefore, we've been comforted by your comfort. We rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I boasted to him about you, I'm not ashamed. But as we, were, we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. You know what I love about this? This is really important. Oh, man, it, I could almost say, you know, maybe maybe soften some of the things I say and, and really ex uh, uh, amplify this one. You know what Paul did? He boasted about the Corinthians w behind their back. He confronted them to their face, but he talked great about them behind their back. Do you see what he was saying? He said, oh, I boasted about you guys. I told them, oh, they'll figure it out. They're really smart. Um, they'll get it right. They're really good. Uh, these guys, God's moving in their midst. Uh, they're going to read this letter and they're going to get it. And it's amazing. I Again, this is one of the, the things I do as an administrator at a school. Just the other day, I had to confront a, a kid, very a high school student, very, very directly. And what I told him is, I'm a fan of yours. I, I believe in you. There might be some people here who don't, but I absolutely believe you have an amazing future. You're one of the kids around here that I've really respected over time. I've seen you do amazing stuff. And I wasn't just blowing smoke at the guy. I, was, I meant it. And he could tell I meant it. I, and and I, I used an example with him of the example that he was. I said, do you understand how many kids look up to you? Do you have any idea how many kids here at this school are asking themselves, what should I do? Well, I'm looking to that kid. And I said, I believe that's who God has made you. I, I boasted on him. And when people left and said, how'd the meeting go? I said, I think it's going to go great. I think it was effective. You know why? Because that's a smart kid and he's going to figure it out. This guy is going to get it right. Now, when you think about that, I said, no, he's a total idiot. He didn't listen why am I doing, I'm boasting about him. And this is what he said. He had already said, the current things, they'll get it right. Was it a risky thing for him to say that? Yeah, he could have said, they'll get it right. And they might've kept getting it wrong. But the greater risk is that you put someone in a prison of mistakes or approaches they've already taken and you never let them out. Because, well, they blew it. They'll keep blowing it. And they might as well. I can remember having this thought as a kid when I got into certain modes and situations, which is I'd get blamed for things I didn't do. Because once you get a, 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 on the certain side of things, you'll, get, you'll be guilty even when you're innocent. And I remember saying, well, I might as well. I might as well have lied because everyone thinks I lied. I might as well steal something because everyone thinks I did. There comes a point where you can get into that mode. And I don't ever want to kind of encourage someone to do that by discouraging someone and just saying, you know what, you're in a prison of your past. This is the exact thing that Paul was trying not to do with them. And I think this is so huge. When somebody apologizes, believe them. I don't know if I believe them. They're probably going to go do it wrong again. Well, why shouldn't they if that's how you think? Why should they change? Where's the incentive? And so when I think about this, he says, I told, I told the truth to you, but I told the best truths about you. There's always best truths. And there's, it wasn't Paul lying or just puffing it up. He was telling the side of the truth 
that he believed God would do, and God did it. He gave him room to change, and I think this is so important in my life. It's important in yours, and the affections are greater for you, he says in verse 15, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice. I have confidence in you in everything. I think this is great. What an amazing place for this chapter to end. Again, when you think about the theology of apology, it's an amazing thing for somebody to have a change of heart that leads to a change of direction. I mean, talk about the greatest miracle. If you say, I've never seen a miracle, I don't care about parting of Red Seas nearly as much as seeing somebody live one way and live a different way. They used to be an angry, thoughtless, ungrateful person, and what do you know? They're the person saying thank you. They're the person making life easier on people around them, looking for ways that they can even in some ways make up for things that they did wrong before. I mean, I, I think that's an amazing thing when someone is motivated by, listen, you don't get into heaven by balancing out your good against your bad, but there's something about someone who's received grace that they say, if I have a bunch in the con column, I would love to have some things in the pro column before I meet God. And that's what Paul was saying, that, that zeal that you said, Whew, I spent too many years doing stuff I regret. I'm not going to hit this reset button and do the same stuff. And I love this thought because there was a pastor's wife that we were so influenced by, this couple. And she was an amazing lady. She had a British accent. She was just as sweet a woman as you could ever want to know. Uh, but her last name was Wild. <laughs> that's what is great because her husband was wild but but he was and but they were wild before they knew the lord and wild even after in some ways but this proper woman i remember her at a conference saying that she was having all kinds of craziness in her life and she went into a counselor and she was talking about this person was messing up her life and this thing was happening and everything and the person at said well carol have you repented And Carol Wilde was like, repented? I just told you everything that everyone's doing wrong and how it's affecting me. And she's, well, that, the counselor said, well, that's interesting, but have you repented? Not of their wrong, but of the things that you... And she's like, I don't know that I ever have. I don't know that I... <laughs> and she said that watershed event in her life, she said, I went home and realized, well, people need to change, but... I'm people too, and I, there's some changes I got to make. And you think about the first recorded words of John the Baptist. They were repent, repent, repent. That times of refreshing might come from the Lord. I don't know if you need times of refreshing, but I know I do. And you know, I think about this. A man pulled into a gas station. Just a simple little illustration. I thought about it. When's the right time for an apology? Well, this guy asked uh, the guy at the gas station, you know, back when they had people at gas stations, um, <laughs> back before it was a little button and everything. Um, how many miles is it to Rockville? And the guy said, well, it's, it's either three miles or 103. It's three miles or 103, what, different routes? And he said, well, yeah, you, you passed it about three miles back. He said, now you could keep going the way you're going for about another 50 miles at dead ends uh, and you'll have to come back. And then it's three miles that way. So it's, it's three miles, or it's 103 miles, depending on when you turn around. See, and I think about it in my life. I'm like, when's the best time to turn around? When I missed it. Well, how long ago did I miss it? Hopefully not too long ago, because then it's, I might only have three miles back. But if I keep saying, well, I don't know, they didn't say they're sorry, and I'm not sorry, and I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I'll have a nice drive until I hear a dead end, and go, man, how far back is it? It's 53 miles. After the 50 miles you just did. Oof, that's a long way back. See, and again, I, it, not to end it on too heavy a note, let me give it, throw one more of my kids under the bus before we go. I'm um, sorry, but not sorry, he's not here. Steven, when he was younger, oh man, that guy used to argue with us all the time about diapers. And if, if, you had, if he had a soggy diaper, we'd say, ooh, looking soggy. He'd go, not soggy. Not soggy, you know, and you're like, this was when he was real young, but not soggy. And you'd go like, man, that thing is soggy. And he's like, not soggy. And we're like, things could be so much better if you just say, sorry, I'm soggy. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, how, how hard is that? Well, apparently it's very hard, but some people never grow out of not soggy, not sorry, sorry, not soggy. Thank you, Lord, for these opportunities we have to think on the simple things of life that can make profound differences in our everyday life. And it's an art, it's a science, it's a skill. Uh, maybe we can practice it. Practice does not make perfect, but it certainly can uh, make better some situations that can be very difficult. And again, uh, I pray that this would fall on the right ears in the right ways, because so often uh, I know we can also be the very person who uh, is so difficult on ourself and and meanwhile there's people all over the place doing things they should be sorry about and we're taking that upon ourselves i pray that nobody would do that because again we have our lives yoked together with you and you oftentimes even if we were to come and say i'm so sorry about that god he'd say what exactly are we talking about um because you forgive and you forget and you give us so many new fresh starts. I pray that this would be one this week, this day, and beyond. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.